West Point, and my areas of research are privacy, information security, cybersecurity, and national security law and policy. Um, before I ever speak on a panel, my institution requires that I say these are my personal views and do not reflect the views of West Point, the Army, or certainly the U.S. government. I am uh, delighted to have a very distinguished panel here today. I'm going to introduce them very briefly, then give a brief introduction, um, and then we'll turn the panel over to Dominic Herman, and we will, um, we're going to wait and take audience questions at the end, but we will try and leave 10 to 15 minutes to do that. Um, so immediately to my left is our moderator, Sabine Glass, who is a professor for criminal law and criminal proceedings at the University of Basel, Switzerland. And I should say um, thank you very much to the Faculty of Law at the University of Basel, who is the organizing institution. Um, and Sabine's current research includes robots and criminal law, as well as robots and criminal procedure. Um, next to Sabine is Jan Philipp Albrecht, who is spokesperson for justice and home affairs at the Greens EFA group in the European Parliament. Um, Jan was also the rapporteur of the European Parliament for the General Data Protection Regulation and for the Data Protection Umbrella Agreement with the US. He is standing rapporteur of the Libra Committee on the Trade Agreements, TTIP and TISA. Um, to his left is David Gray. David teaches criminal law, criminal procedure, evidence, international criminal law and jurisprudence at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. His scholarly interests focus on criminal law, criminal procedure, privacy, constitutional theory, and transnational justice. Um, to his left is Dominic Herman, who is a full professor for privacy and security and information systems at the University of Bamberg, Germany. Dominic works on the design and evaluation of usable and unobtrusive privacy enhancing technologies with a focus on protection against undesirable tracking of online and mobile users. And finally, Miltos Kyriakidis is a senior wor researcher working in the Singapore ETH Center and is involved in the Future Resilient Systems Program. He is conducting research on human performance, human robot reliability, safety, and reliance of critical infrastructure. Okay, thank you, Stephanie. There's nothing more I could add to these introductions except that Stephanie and me, we connect because in her former life, she has been a federal prosecutor. She never prosecuted me, <laughs> but we discussed uh, a lot of details of criminal procedure, and actually this is my role as a moderator. Whenever we drift away from criminal law, I will bring us back to criminal law. <laughs> and now it's Dominic's turn. Actually, let me give a brief um, framing introduction to the panel. Yes, oh, uh, okay. sorry. No worries. Um, so imagine a driver safety program facilitated by Apple's iPhone 3D mapping technology, which utilizes a so-called true depth camera. As reported in the Washington Post, this camera produces a wireframe representation of a driver's face and then maps a live readout of 52 unique micro movements in the eyelids, mouth, and other facial areas and features. When such mapping is combined with other software programs that analyze facial expressions and movements, a tired or distracted driver could be detected. A warning issued to the car's onboard system, and if necessary, mechanical interventions initiated. The more a driver uses the technology, the better it works as it learns to read and understand each driver's facial expressions with an ever improving degree of precision and accuracy. Additional sensor technologies integrated into the car's onboard system that measure breathing changes, heart rate, and body temperature 
could further enhance the car's ability to detect a tired or distracted driver. Insurance companies would be sure to incentivize the use of such technology as um, it would reduce their financial exposure and it would save lives. And law enforcement would be interested as well. Such systems would allow them better to determine the causes of accidents and would also provide opportunities for early intervention when tired or distracted driver data is made available to police officers in real time, allowing them to screen every car and driver on the road and to pull people over for sustained, distracted, or drowsy driving. But this is only one example of how the machines in our lives can gr greatly improve our safety and enhance our health and well-being. Let us not forget the humble refrigerator. Imagine a refrigerator with the capacity to monitor which foods come in, which go out, when, and in what amounts and volumes. Imagine further a refrigerator that is linked to your bathroom scale, your smartphone loaded with M health apps, your wearable devices, your health records, providing it, your refrigerator, with a regular stream of information it can use to screen and determine what kinds of foods you should eat, when, and how much. And of course, there's no need to shop. Your refrigerator will order your groceries for delivery for you. Um, and that eliminates, of course, all chances, chances of weakness as you pass the cookies and chocolate in the grocery store aisle. Such a device at the head of a biomanagement technology system would potentially save thousands of lives a year by promoting healthy eating and even preventing unhealthy eating. This data would be of great interest to insurance companies, public health officials, and even law enforcement. So biological signal monitoring technologies have incredible potential to improve the quality of life and to reduce immortality from accidents, suicide, violence, and disease. But who should have access to the data gathered and analysis performed by these technologies? How should such technologies be regulated? And what if manufacturers of these products and systems or even customers employ technologies that may prevent disclosure of biological signals data to interested parties? Do we have a right to employ such technologies or to design systems in ways that may impede or ultimately preclude law enforcement or regulators from accessing decrypted data? These questions and others will be addressed by our distinguished panelists. And with that, um, I'd like to turn the panel over to Dominic. Thank you so much, Stephanie. And with that, uh, we, can, we can start. So this panel consists of technologists and of legal scholars. So we hope to, and actually one politician, so we hope to, to give the, a broad picture of the whole topic here. And my job is for everyone to um, get on the same page to show you lots of examples of what can go well and how it can, can go wrong. And the initial slide already hints at what we will be talking about, at least um, in the beginning, which is um, the detection of moods and emotions from facial expressions. So probably like um, the girl in the picture here, you are quite tired. Hopefully you are still excited. I mean, you're here, in us, uh, here with us in the room. And by the end of this panel, you will be happy that you can leave the room, I guess. Nevertheless, that it will be interesting. So let's start off with benefits and risks. So. I will talk about facial expressions and I will also talk about motion data later on. And as Stephanie already has hinted at, um, the fact that Apple introduced this 3D camera in its iPhone X system, um, people wonder what will be possible with that. And because I can't tell you the future, I'll stick with what's already possible today and then I will let you extrapolate what will be possible in the future. So one thing which is imagined is a very good and very efficient de drowsiness detection system if those systems are being deployed in, in cars. And that's actually not quite far-fetched because uh, the drowsiness detection system, which is shown on this slide, is actually a do-it-yourself kit which can, which can be built with a Raspberry Pi and each and every webcam you have at home 
uh, and a couple of lines of Python code, which would not be a problem for a computer scientist to do as a weekend project. So that's quite possible that we will see that in the very soon future. And the question is who's going to read the data which the camera records besides your car. So if you're doing it as a do-it-yourself project, no one but you. But um, if it's built in in your car, you never know who's going to use it. So this is only the most popular topic, I guess. Let's turn a little bit more to the worrisome things, so which has been around for quite a while, is the possibility to, de de to detect motions and emotions from, from facial expressions. And there's actually a nice system you can play around with built by Microsoft, which is the motion and emotion detection engine of Microsoft, which you can upload a picture to and it will just detect its emotions. And as you can see, it's so those are pictures other people have already lo uh, uploaded there. This is quite accurate. Yeah, so guy on the left, so kid on the left, uh, appears to be surprised and the success kid, which is a quite famous internet meme, some of, may, uh, some of you may know, um, seems to be quite angry that whatever uh, castle it built uh, in the sand probably has fallen apart. So that was a couple of years ago. We are way further already in research. So what people are talking about in research at the moment is uh, mood detection by looking at micro expressions. So micro expressions are expressions which are not as visible as macro expressions. And if you look longer at those two images here, it will for most humans still be quite difficult to detect that the guy um, on, the top uh, on the top frame here um, appears to be more happy than on the bottom frame. And there are systems which are quite capable of detecting that completely automatically due to modern machine learning technologies. So this can be turned um, against us, obviously. I mean, whatever can be used for good use can also be used for bad use. And some of you may be familiar with uh, le uh, recent work by the Kosinski group. Kosinski was the one who uh, already made, was, was infamously um, cited because he was related to Cambridge Analytica and uh, the possibility to infer psychological traits from Facebook likes. So a more recent work by his group uh, looks at the question whether you can actually determine sexual orientation by looking at people's facial images, um, which, is, which has been heavily criticized, of course, and the ramifications of this study are still not completely known. Yeah. So the methodology is a little bit questionable because all those pictures have been pulled from Tinder, which may, may, know, which may mean that the first, the ground truth may be not completely accurate and maybe there's a structural bias in the data. Yeah, so, but nevertheless, still that the system he built is able to to do the detection quite accurately should make you worried. Now turning away from facial expressions, let's look at um, body signals which can also be detected by wearable technology. And with wearable, wearable technology, I mean what is around today. Yeah? So smart watches, smartphones in your pockets and so on. So most people who actually buy that stuff, they like it for some reason. Yeah? And the reasons they like it for are very tempting reasons. So most of those um, who buy it would say they use it to live more healthy, to actually track their sports activities. And in research, there has been a, lo a lot of other ideas how this technology could be used. Uh, one thing which you could use it for is actually the um, prediction of heart attacks and strokes um, by just wearing a smartwatch which uh, accurate accurately enough measures your heart rate. It could also be used for a public infrastructure. Imagine a smartwatch which you wear during driving a car whenever you drive over a pothole and your car uh, bumps into it, this could be automatically uploaded to your government's uh, public um, infrastructure services so that they can uh, send in the guys who fix the pothole. So there are really compelling reasons why this technology might be useful and why actually sharing the data might actually uh, be a good idea. But again, the question is whether this is only useful or whether there are risks involved that you might want to know about. And the reason that um, everyone loves those technologies and no one really fears them, probably not in this room, but the general uh, public apparently, is that the reason th is that the risks are in a distant future and are they appear not to be too bad in comparison to the benefits. Yeah, so there has been um, a lot of work on the privacy paradoxon, and this is also visible in the smartwatch business, where if you ask people whether they have actually read the privacy policy. Um, once they bought the smartwatch, the fraction of people who say, yes, I read it, uh, is much lower than the people who say, yes, I will read it before they buy it. Uh, so once you're convinced that the technology is interesting for you, you actually are, don't care and trust it. Uh, and this is in, in the light of those attacks which are hinted at on the slide, yeah, the fact that you can infer whether someone smokes because of characteristic hand movement or whether someone types in one, two, three, four, five 
as a pin or something else due to how you hold your smartphone with a hand, um, this is something which it may, in my opinion is quite questionable. Now law enforcement, and I have to talk about law enforcement because otherwise uh, Sabine will um, raise her hand at some point, uh, is also interested in that. In Germany there's a very recent case where they actually get uh, a hold of an iPhone of a suspect and could um, use the health data, which is basically motion data and extract that. And the uh, health data is now being used as a very convincing piece of evidence because it su suggests that uh, the suspect uh, climbed down some streets, which is in fact he walked down uh, to a riverbed uh, where he killed his victim. And this is going to be a major piece of evidence in the court now because it's very difficult for the, uh, sub for the suspect to prove otherwise. Yeah? So his phone will be used against him. And again, the question is whether from a privacy perspective, this is something which we should tolerate or which we should not tolerate. Now, the question is whether we can somehow have the benefits of those systems and still regain our privacy at the same time, or whether we just have to live with the conflict and have to select one of the two sides. And today, this is probably, at least most people I have talked to, they would say, no, you have to either get security or privacy. You get law enforcement or privacy, but you can't have both. And in fact, if you look at what has happened in the past, this may be true. Yeah? So we have encryption and anonymization, and this fails a lot of the time. Yeah? Look at all the security holes and vulnerabilities. And often it's in conflict with the benefits. Yeah? So you want to have all the benefits of pothole detection. Yeah, you will have to, at some point, share the data with a central authority. So apparently this is unresolvable. And obviously law enforcement is much more difficult if uh, the police can't get its hand on the data. However, there is kind of a, I would say, at least a small hope that this will be possible in the future because the area of privacy enhancing technologies where I work in is quite actively searching for solutions which will actually allow us to have both, yeah, privacy and the benefits of sharing and collecting data. And technologies which will be relevant here, so you could keep that term in mind, is what is referred to as revocable privacy, which is a concept which means that privacy is technology-wise guaranteed unless some rules are um, broken and people who break those rules will basically automatically lose their privacy. That's different from today where basically a police investigator decides when the privacy is uh, to be lost and in future this could be basically delegated to technology. Now, this will not come for free. Yeah? The market will not adop adopt that because of market forces, but I think we will need regulation as an incentive. And with those three statements here, I will leave you. So I think that um, sacrificing privacy is a natural thing yeah, because we are all humans and we want to be gratified immediately. So we always will trade in that. Um, but there's technology on, on, on the brink of what we have today, which will help us in the future. And I think this will not come for free. We will need incentives, incentives to deploy it. And that's where I hope that regulators will understand that it's their part to do something. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dominic. And you nicely referred to law enforcement, but I won't let you off the hook so easily. You never um, stated your opinion. Do you think there's a red line or you think everything could use as evidence against... Like so my opinion on that topic is that it's too dangerous to take uh, data for as evidence in court because data can be fabricated, data can be manipulated, and data can be, and that's probably the worst thing, it can be intentionally omitted, yeah, which is impossible to prove. So if you have some convincing evidence and you just get rid of it, um, then no one will be able to prove that there was evidence of this kind yeah, because deletion of data is traceless and that's something which is quite worrisome and very different from evidence, like physical evidence. So I'd like to turn to Jan now um, and, and specific specifically ask you what principles should inform a regulatory framework for access and disclosure of biological signals monitoring data as our policy. I would first of all uh, get into th that question if um, data should be used uh, in criminal investigations and in courts because I think that question uh, is and has been answered very often by uh, reality and that is that when, when it comes to very severe crimes, when it comes to terrorism or other issues where, like for example, 
sexual abuse or uh, issues where the public is really aware about the fact that uh, there needs to be uh, an answer also in the name of justice that data will be used. Data will be accessed, will be used, and will become evidence in court rooms. And uh, that is one of the reasons why I uh, think if we talk about this in a way that we say it's fine that the data is there, but it shouldn't be accessed by police or justice authorities, then I think we're on the wrong track because that won't be the case. And I say it as a politician who is absolutely uh, uh, from the beginning, got into who, uh, who got into politics to prevent uh, police injustice, to uh, unproportionately access information. Uh, but I just see that the amount of information which is generated in our new technological devices which we develop, and we have seen some of the applications, that this amount um, can't be just uh, put into the hands of like businesses and individuals, consumers, and bring us all new opportunities. But but on the other side, we say it can't be available for uh, situations where we talk about uh, uh, criminal investigations or other law enforcement aspects. Uh, it will always be uh, in the same way also used and accessed on that side. And that is why uh, I would also follow up to uh, that idea of saying um, if we are going into uh, the direction of further developing this ground, which we are all doing, of having facial recognition and motion recognition, uh, for example, in cars, but also in other situations, then uh, we should think about this from the first place and think about it in a way that we say, okay, if we don't want to end up, uh, to, to let that end up in a courtroom, we perhaps shouldn't just, not, uh, shouldn't just use it as personal data in the first place. Uh, so to make things anonymous from the first place in those uh, uh, environments like in self-driving cars or in uh, car assistance systems, or in, or in, in data uh, collection uh, and sensors when it comes to these uh, holes in the street and so on, we should just make sure that this is not individualized data and not um, a personal data because in the end we will always be able to access that. And then, of course, there will be always the situation where we have personal data because it's uh, the question who owns that car, for example, and the question, um, I don't know, uh, uh, when I want to identify myself, for example, by, I don't know, my face. Now we have this un face ID uh, discussion with Apple and so on. There are these situations that then the safeguards are high so that I'm first of all informed about what is happening here, that maybe this data can be accessed, for example, by law enforcement authorities under this and that ground. and. First of all, and that is one of the biggest questions right now, which jurisdiction does it fall under? Um, uh, so which laws do apply, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that there the regulatory framework is uh, the most important when it comes to uh, identifying or identifiability of this data to a person. The, the whole problem which I have at the moment is that all of this is developed uh, in the understanding that we just need to pseudonymize it, we just need to make sure that people feel safe, uh, that the data is not accessed uh, inappropriately or whatever, uh, and that there is some imagination of um, we need to just have an opinion which says uh, the FBI should not be able to access it or Europol or any member state authority should not be able to access it. Uh, I, I really don't think that this debate is uh, suitable because at the moment we have a development uh, which is clearly going in the direction that more of this data needs to be made available and uh, in many uh, occasions it is very hard to justify that it shouldn't be done. Um, the, the bigger debate which we have on the criminal law and the law enforcement side is if the uh, law enforcement authorities can ask data to be personal in the first place or can ask data to be retained in the first place. 
only for the possibility of law enforcement to access it later on. And that is, I think, the more dangerous development and where I would clearly say that shouldn't be uh, done if you don't need the data for technical necessity or because we just agree all it should be f uh, processed, then uh, it shouldn't uh, be done and it shouldn't be also required by law enforcement authorities uh, because that's about the presumption of innocence, that the presumption also of, uh, yeah, not being subject to surveillance in the first place, but only if there is an indication for law enfor enforcement authorities, then uh, they can start uh, um, retaining or collecting or surveying uh, uh, data or individuals in that uh, uh, context also. A follow up. So, uh, do I understand you to say then that um, you would not? support regulation that would require companies to build their systems in such a way that even when law enforcement comes with the appropriate court process, um, it may be encrypted and they're unable to decrypt it. Exactly. That's, uh, it, that's exactly this last part which I mentioned. So the, the requirement vis-a-vis uh, -vis developers or especially uh, those who build products or who uh, sell business uh, solutions, for example, the requirement to already foresee the need for law enforcement authorities already inbuilt backdoors or inbuilt the possibilities to re-identify information and so on, that should be uh, forbidden. And I think that this is really something where we talk about what is the essence of what we are protecting? Because we are protecting a liberal society, we are protecting a society where um, we are not subject to harm uh, in a way that there could be backdoors, so that we inbuilt also backdoors for criminals or for other people. That is what we should really concentrate uh, on when it is about preserving uh, integrity and, and privacy and uh, also control about what happens uh, in these systems. But we shouldn't think about that there is a solution, which sometimes I hear from uh, business sides in particular, uh, to say, no worries, in this system, everything will be safe. The self-driving car, it will co uh, process your data. Yes, it's fine, and we need the 90 pages of consent, but uh, no, law enforcement will never get it, and we will fight as hard as possible that they won't get it. This just doesn't work, and that's, that's just natural, because uh, if you talk and, uh, in, in society and in political debates, of course, if it really comes down to the individual case, and we have these terrorism cases right now here in Europe, for example, then in the end, people will say, yeah, but there, if there is data, if there is evidence or even indices on a certain case uh, of certain persons involved in a certain uh, uh, um, uh, development, then it needs to be able to access that. That's and, and, and society decides to say, uh, if, if you have some uh, reason to, to get after people, then you should do it. The, the point is, uh, and that is, I think, where the debate has to be led to, the society also says, if you don't have evidence or you don't have any point to follow somebody, then you shouldn't follow them at all. And uh, the, the development in these technologies is just that I see at the moment that companies feel that they can follow everyone um, and that they can, uh, but in the same way, promise the individual that they are never followed by the law enforcement authorities. And that is a, a little bit uh, dishonest, I would also say. Thank you. David. So if my iPhone could, if my iPhone could read me, it would say jet lag, so I'm going to walk around. So the, uh, what I'm going to talk about is, is precisely this question of encryption in particular, and more generally, uh, right to go dark, if I could just have my slides. All right. Um, and so this is part of a, a broader uh, conversation that we can have about anonymizing technology, um, TOR, any way that you could prevent yourself um, from being surveilled or information be ga be, uh, be from being gathered about you. And the encryption debate in the United States comes out of a, notor a notorious case of the San Bernardino terrorist attacks. So Saeed, uh, uh, Saeed uh, 
I'm going to get this name wrong, um, Saeed Farouk and Tashfin Malik um, engaged in a terrorist attack, killed 14 people, injured a number uh, 22. And at the scene, officers discovered an iPhone um, that they suspected might contain additional evidence leading them to other terrorist uh, uh, plans for other terrorist events or other uh, members of a terrorist network. Um, the problem was that the phone was encrypted. They couldn't get into it. They couldn't uh, get any of the data off of it. So they approached Apple and asked Apple if they would build a back door and allow law enforcement officers to get into the phone. And Apple demurred um, and ended up being subject to a court order demand commanding them to break into that iPhone. Now, they were rescued at the last minute um, by a hacker uh, who was hired by the FBI. But in the wake of that, uh, James Comey, a hero to some of us now, but a villain to mo many of us then, said that this is a travesty. We can't live in a situation where any consumer has access to encryption technology that denies law enforcement access to a cell phone, even if they have a warrant to get into that phone. So that's the debate that we have in the United States now. It's not been settled. Congress considered a law that would have required companies like Apple to build back doors in. That law was dropped in the Senate. And so we're left with this conversation about whether or not we indeed should have a right to go dark. Should I, do I have a right to encryption on my phone or other anonymizing technologies? And I'm going to be a little parochial that under United States law, that I think there are three potential constitutional or legal foundations that we might look at. One is the Fourth Amendment. The other is the Fifth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment protects us against unreasonable searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment protects our right not to be compelled to witness against ourselves. And common law privileges, which protect, uh, protect security and communications with a range of professionals. And so I'm going to give you a quick sketch of what the arguments for a right to to go dark, a right to encryption might look like under each one of those legal foundations. So this is our Fourth Amendment. It protects a right of the people, importantly, to be secure against unreasonable searches and seizures. Um, and the Fourth Amendment is governed by the, the real lodestar, the real centerpiece of the Fourth Amendment is the question of what constitutes a search. And that, in turn, is determined by two inquiries. First, does government activity constitute a physical intrusion into a constitutionally protected area, a person, house, paper, or effect under Olmstead versus the United States? Or does it intrude upon subjectively manifested expectations of privacy that society is prepared to recognize as reasonable, the famous CATS test? And the centerpiece of the development of that, of that Fourth Amendment law was wiretapping. So under Olmstead, wiretapping is not a search. There's no physical intrusion into a person, house, paper, or effect. But under cats, it is because it violates subjectively manifested and reasonable expectations of privacy. Th so that shift seemed to move co Fourth Amendment law in the United States towards a place where we could have additional security and communications um, in the kind of data that might be stored on our personal devices or on our phones. And the court brought cats home to cell phones in 2014 in a case called Riley versus California, where it held that we have a subjectively manifested expectation of privacy in the data on our phones. It's probably an effect, and going into the phone to get that data might constitute a physical intrusion of sorts. And so in Riley, the court said law enforcement officers have to have a warrant to get into a phone. Great. Fantastic. Um, this term, the court is considering a case called Carpenter, which asks whether law enforcement officers should likewise have to get a warrant in order to get access to cell site location information. I think most of us who are watching this case think the court is going to hold that law enforcement officers, that that's a search, um, but th we don't know why or how. So the court, we, the court seems to be uh, angling towards a result, but doesn't know what the, mo the justification is going to be quite yet. But again, that would be great. It would provide protections of that cell site location information. But the problem is, of course, that it's not an absolute protection. Um, law enforcement agencies, and it, it, does, and it is only engages two very narrow circumstances of what might concern us as privacy advocates and privacy scholars. Left untouched are a whole range of visual surveillance technologies, big data surveillance technologies, biometric surveillance technologies that simply aren't covered by existing Fourth Amendment law. And then, of course, there's the problem of national security um, surveillance, which might not respect the Fourth Amendment at all or would uh, dodge around the, its edges so that even the things that are protected by the Fourth Amendment might nevertheless be subject to governmental intrusion. 
And in, uh, and, and in the face of all of these threats, in the United States we have sort of a blasé approach by Congress where they seem to ratify a lot of existing uh, approaches and, and certainly don't take up the baton of uh, providing additional protections. In a recent book, um, I argued that this has put us in a condition where we're subject to what might be described as an age of surveillance. And so the book Ant tries to address that age of surveillance question, the challenges to the Fourth Amendment, by engaging in an originalist rereading of the Fourth Amendment um, that really recognizes its collective dimensions and makes the argument that we have an absolute right under the Fourth Amendment to guarantees against discretionary governmental searches that are effective in limiting that discretion and forcible and parsimonious with respect to the interests of individuals, the people, um, on and, and the people both on the privacy side and on the law enforcement and security side. Oh, okay. Um, and so, how might encryption fit in there? Well, encryption is really the 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 best kind of self help that you could imagine. Uh, it's kind of like putting a lock on your door or putting your documents in a safe. And so, it certainly manifest that reasonable expectation of privacy. And so that's important under the CATS test, um, but even as uh, against government intrusions that aren't regarded as searches or government intrusions that might uh, violate the Fourth Amendment knowingly or by mistake, it's an effective and forcible means of self-help to protect us against those kinds of government intrusions. The problem, uh, of course, is that it's absolute. And so James Comey's complaint, of course, is that what if we have a warrant? What if we go to court? What if we get a warrant? We still can't get into that phone. And so there's a significant cost to encryption, but the question, I think, for us and under the going in the going dark debate is whether we live in a, a, state, a, a, a condition where we have sufficient trust in our legal regimes and our administrative actors that we would deny ourselves this absolute self-help. The Fifth Amendment famously protects uh, individuals against compelled witnessing. And back in the very beginning of, of, of the Fifth Amendment jurisprudence uh, that uh, marks the modern era in 1886, the court held that we have a Fifth Amendment right, that United States citizens have a Fifth Amendment right to documents that they produce, and that the compelled production of those documents, if they contained incriminatory content, would be a form of self-incrimination, and that compelled production of the documents would be barred by the Fifth Amendment. Sounds fantastic, but what the court gave in Boyd, it took away in Fisher versus United States in 1976, and held that if somebody voluntarily creates a document, that is not compelled witnessing, and that therefore the government can compel the production of that document without violating the Fourth Amendment. So if you confess to a murder in your diary, hoping that your diary won't, report, won't report on you, the Fifth Amendment provides absolutely no protection against the government getting access to that diary. Now there's a little bit of an exception to that, which is that where the pr act of production itself is testimonial. So if the act of production demonstrates your knowledge about the existence of a document that the government didn't pri have prior knowledge about or authenticates that document in some way, then that can be an expressive act that would be covered by the Fifth Amendment. But the court has developed a number of workarounds, including the so-called foregone conclusion um, do doctrine and, the pr and immunity, which so if somebody is, if the government asks for a document they already know about and immunizes the act of production, then you have no Fifth Amendment complaint. And so you might, it, and so under that regime, a number of courts have held that we don't have, that an individual can be compelled to decrypt their cell phone, including uh, biometrically, that's easy, but including entering a passcode, even that ent though entering that passcode is a production of a, a mental, a production of a mental process, the product of a mental process, that that can be compelled as long as the government knows with reasonable certainty what it's looking for in the phone and they immunize that act of production. The problem, of course, is that that foregone conclusion doctrine, which was really built around paper documents and business records, might not accurately reflect the nature of the technologies that would be subject to compelled revelation um, in a Fourth Amendment context these days. And the court itself recognized the ubiquity of cell phones, how they've really in many ways become physical extensions of ourselves, and that's only going to get worse as they become more and more integrated with the Internet of Things and with wearable technologies. 
And these technologies have a number of important features that I think are worth our thinking about in the context of a Fifth Amendment right to, to encryption. The first is that the collection of a lot of the data is passive. It, we're not entering in, so there's no voluntary construction of the content. The content is created passively as we go through our days with these technologies. And that gathering parallels our neural collection of that same data. My phone knows where I've been, and I know where I've been, and we're gathering that data together, my phone and I. Um, and that, that data is integrated a lot across an different technologies, so it's not just my phone that knows where my I am, but also my wearable, um, and integrated with me. And so in many ways, I sort of rely on my phone to tell me where I was, so I don't have to try to remember that, because particularly in my current state, I can't remember where I was earlier this morning. And so I rely on these devices more and more as extensions of myself to do the kinds of things that I normally would have done with my own brain. And so does this lead to a Fifth Amendment right to encryption? Well, the traditional Fifth Amendment uh, right was the secrecy that I had in my own brain. Right? They can't, they, there's no brain scanner that they can use to get my thoughts out of me, to get the results of my mental processes out of me. Um, but as I become a, cyber, a cyborg, uh, maybe the only way to replicate the natural protection of my skull is through some kind of encryption. Okay, so one um, last potential source of law, common law privileges. So under American law, uh, the common law provides for protections, uh, uh, protected communications with, uh, in a number of different circumstances, including doctor, patient, psychotherapist, marital, and clergy, which are gonna be the important ones for us. And courts in general are very reluctant to recognize these kinds of privileges because they have tremendous cost to truth seeking. Courts only do so when there's sig a significant public policy justification for recognizing that privilege. And so might there be that kind of argument for some of these technologies? And particularly when we talk about some of the technologies at issue here today, uh, driver monitoring, health monitoring, uh, psych uh, psychiatric monitoring, the use of, uh, of medical devices, um, even devices that monitor if my child is wetting the bed, all of these are technologies that have a, a very important role to play in advancing important personal goals that are uh, that are that also are of social importance, and of course those that those devices operate in close contact with us. And in order for them to do their job, we have to be open and honest with them. We have to share all that information with them. So does that put them in line with things like the doctor-patient uh, privilege, like the marital privilege, um, like the psychotherapist privilege, um, like the clerical privilege? Well, I think that there's a good argument that they very well may. And so the same right to privacy, to secrecy in those communications that we have with persons, we ought maybe also have in the context of our communications with our technologies. Thank you very much. You are lucky that he didn't call you to answer his questions. Yeah. If you would be his student, he would do that. I now know that Stephanie would love to make a constitutional case against this case, but that would lead us to uh, some US constitutional discussion and you want, do not want to go that way, I think. So I will try to bridge what you just said to what Jan Philipp said before. You made a very good case against the government. So now, is there a right against people who sell us all these nice gadgets to go dark, too, or but isn't there any? So do you mean that, th th should, uh, should my cell phone provider be able to encrypt that data and protect it? Um, and so I think a lot of that um, depends on, well, just take the common law privileges as, as, as an example. A lot of that depends on how we conceptualize my relationship with my phone company. Um, we think about my relationship with my phone company now in purely business terms that are familiar from when phones were landlines. Um, but my relationship with my phone company is going to continue to get a lot deeper and more intimate as time goes on, and that technology is also linked in with, a, and my, my phone company is selling me not just phone service, but also um, exercise support services and physical health services. Um, and th that's the way that these technologies are gonna be integrated across commercial platforms, but also with us. And so if that's right, then it seems to me that I ought to be thinking about, if not now, then very soon, my phone company in the same way that I think about my doctor, that those are very private communications that I, to which I have a right that they not be disclosed. And if that's right, then it's my phone company's obligation to enforce that, uh, uh, to enforce that right uh, on my behalf. So if the government comes calling, they have to say, no, I won't hand that over, I'm, I'm, uh, it's privileged 
Supreme Court. So would you extend that as far as in the Apple versus iPhone case that you started out your presentation with, as you noted, um, the government had a warrant for the phone, but ultimately hired a third party entity to break the phone. Did the government in hiring that entity uh, commit a, a Fourth Amendment or Fifth Amendment violation? So the, so in that case in particular, it was a little bit easy because the owner of the iPhone was dead, and so um, probably his, his constitutional rights died with him. But the, but the, the broader question is, should I, ha should, should, I have a, should I have the access to technology that makes impenetrable my devices in the same way that my thoughts and memories are naturally impenetrable by virtue of my biological s of, bi of, of my biology? Um, and the answer to that question is a, a, a big question mark. I think that's a legitimate question to be asked. But one of the real problems that we have from a Fourth Amendment side now is an absence of responsible congressional regulation of, of, of law enforcement activities um, and, s and the failure of an administrative state to regulate itself. So you take the easy case of a warrant for a phone um, by ignoring – and uh, sure, in, in a world where there is a complete set of regulations that make me completely comfortable in my Fourth Amendment rights to data and the content of my devices, then I'm willing to allow that to go forth. But that's not the world we live in. Um, and so I think encryption might be the self-help that we get for living in a world that is, uh, can fairly be described as compromised in terms of justice and privacy. Thank you, David. So last but certainly not least, Neil Totes is going to talk to us about um, technology, perhaps not so far in the future, self-driving cars. Thank you, Jill. So I'm going to talk about data configurations in the area of self-driving cars. And then in the first part of my presentation, I will be talking about uh, the good side of the data, why this data is necessary for the technology to, to be uh, mature enough uh, in order to, to, to provide solutions. And in the second part, I will actually uh, share with you some of my uh, questions and uh, thoughts that I, I have and concerns that I have with respect to, to this data. Concerns regarding the ownership of the data, uh, concerns about the access of this data, the storage of the data, uh, the duration of this storage, and finally, uh, questions that I have and I, I might have some, some initial results about that is whether us as a, as a potential consumers or customers or users of this, uh, this technology actually are interested in privacy uh, and security of this, of this data. So to begin with, uh, just for all of us to be on the same page, what is actually a self-driving car? A self-driving car is any car that has some automated features in it. It could be either with a driver or in the probably not so close, but definitely not very far future, it will be a car with no driver as well in, uh, in the cockpit. Now, depending on, on the level of, uh, of automation, uh, in this case, the data uh, that will be get into, the, into those vehicles should be more or less. And what the, where this data will be coming from, it will be data from communication between the vehicles themselves. It will be data uh, coming from the vehicle to the infrastructure, to the infrastructure, to the vehicle, and vice versa. And what this picture doesn't show is also the data that will be uh, transmitting by the users. So we are not, uh, we are in this car, but we are not seen right now. And why do we need this data? This data is necessary because they will increase their safety. They will definitely be helpful in, in terms of uh, reducing traffic congestion. In theory, we will be uh, reducing CO2 emissions and definitely will be providing mobility for all. That includes elderly or people with disabilities. What is the classification of this data and how this data might be uh, used for? So we have technical data. Technical data that will be uh, received from the sensors of the cars and can be used to increase safety, to increase reliability of the technology, and to increase comfort of the ride. So I overall, it will be a better and win-win situation for all of us. It will be crowdsourcing data from the people that they are using the data. So I if, for instance, they are in traffic jam, they will be posting on Facebook or uh, on Twitter, we are in traffic jam, and other people may see that. And lastly, it will be personal data regarding the location of the car at the time of the journey, uh, the destination, the speed, 
the locations of interest of, of the user, and the stops that may be doing, and so forth. So in the longer run, this data will be more and more and more and more advanced. So we could be using all this information to define travel patterns, uh, frequent locations, places uh, not visited anymore, uh, cameras in the, in the car will be able to detect whether a user is able to, to drive this car or not. And we may have also wheel sensors for fingerprints or uh, cameras to define the user and driver. So a teenager won't be able to get into the car and go for a ride. So it, it will be increased safety. Uh, and it will again uh, affect uh, traffic congestion and mobility for elderly. But consider th this amount of data will be collecting for years and years and years or for some time. What is happening with the privacy of us? And this is where it comes to, to, to what are the privacy uh, considerations for self-driving cars. So NHTSA, which is a National Highway uh, Transport Administration, a safety administration, two years ago, less than two years ago, uh, launched, uh, published uh, the federal uh, the federal uh, legislation for self-driving cars. And in, in, in the section of privacy, they are talking about transparency, choice, respect for context, minimization, de-identification and retention, data security, integrity, and access, and accountability. And when I was reading that, I'm an engineer, the most common thing that I found is this sentence in accordance with applicable privacy notices, agreements, and principles. And honestly, instead of being making me more comfortable, I started worried about that because I have no idea what it is. And I have no idea how many of those uh, privacy notices are out there or might be out there, how many agreements will be there, and how many principles will be there. And now I will start sharing my questions based on, on, on this picture. First of all, regarding data ownership and access. Who's going to, to own this data? Will it be the user, us? Will it be the car manufacturer because they will be claiming that they need this data to make the cars safer and safer and safer, and to some extent it's true. Is it going to be the insurance companies who will be uh, willing to insure a car only if they know that this car is safe and they need to access uh, information regarding that? It will be the governmental bodies or regulatory bodies in order to, to in, uh, improve regulations or not, or it can be other, other establishments like data mining companies. What about the use of data? Okay, some, they will be using it for uh, increasing uh, safety and reliability. Maybe it will affect uh, insurance premiums. So insurance companies that they know that this car has a safe profile, they will uh, decrease the insurance premium. It could be for law uh, enforcement. We are getting involved with an accident and then this data might be used in our favor or against us or it could be for marketing, many other uh, potential. Data storage, where this data will be stored in a vehicle as a black box on, uh, on the cloud. It could be the car manufacturers or uh, insurance company servers. Uh, it could be uh, a governmental uh, establishment that they will be collecting all this data uh, and will be stored there. Nobody knows. Would the users be able to choose where they want to s store th 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 this data? Do they will have actually uh, a, a, a say in, uh, in this storage process? And what about the duration? It will be a single trip, because if it is a single trip, someone would say, okay, as soon as you get off the car, the data will be deleted, you have no problem about privacy. Is this will be the case, or it will be weekly, monthly, annually, forever, and so forth. Again, would the user be able to choose what they want and Cross countries would be all the same or different, nobody knows. And finally, about how do we perceive the, the problems with, uh, with self-driving cars and, and, and privacy? Two years ago, we, we did a study uh, at the University of Delft uh, with 5,000 people, asking them what is the intention to buy or to use self-driving cars. And one of the questions was, what are they worried about those cars? And as you can see, most of them uh, were saying uh, the legal aspects, the safety, uh, the joy, and privacy is actually the last one of these five. And this brings me to, 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 to the question, actually, do we really care about the privacy of our data? For instance, when I arrived at Brussels two, year, two days ago and I was at the airport, the first thing I, do, I did is I logged in in the free Wi-Fi 
uh, of Brussels Airport. Did I read the term conditions? No. Did I give access to my data to them? Probably yes. So what I think is the takeaway here uh, is that definitely we need data uh, if we want to have self-driving cars in, uh, on the public roads. The more data we have, uh, the better the cars uh, they'll become, so we will be having safer roads. Uh, the less congestion we will be having, the more comfortable rides, rides we will be having, and definitely we will be offering mobility for all. Now on the other side, and on the do downside, is that if we overlook the case of privacy and handling of those data, this might be an issue for acceptance of those data. So it is in the end a trade-off or a compromise whether we are more willing towards safety or more privacy, or where we can find that balance. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we have about uh, 12 minutes left. Thank you, panelists, for all staying on time. Um, so we'd like love to invite some questions from the audience. Hello, Tobias Moschus from Datenschutz. Um, when I look at the uh, development of these technologies and uh, uh, principles that are developed now, uh, I ask my question, what happens if the sensors get better and better and we have more and more sensors out there getting a better and better picture? We have already the point where the uh, movement sensor in the smartwatch can read the password when I type the password. What happens if I have a thousand sensors around and uh, every device uh, knows everything about everything I do? May, may I follow up with the question? Because you know you were arguing for both of you, actually, the right to go dark against government and, um, and private. But with the connected traffic, that would not be a possibility, I think. Because I think it would only work if we have a car-to-car -car connection and, ac and the sensors that collect all the data, actually we probably would have to tag pedestrians so that the car would realize there's a small kid. And so I think with um, the more complex um, uh, machines we have around us, probably the right to go dark diminishes. So I, I really don't. It, this is my paper is a true research project. I'm not really sure where it comes out. I have sort of two versions now at this point. Um, but I think it comes down to a question of public policy in, and a reflection of where we are in, relation in our relationship to government entities. And so if we have a responsible public policy debate and government accepts and respects reasonable limitations on its access to this kind of information, then the world that you describe as a maybe, I think, is an inevitable one. Um, and the real question is, d have we had a sufficiently robust and responsible public policy debate that we don't need to resort to the self-help of going dark? Um, or do we continue down the road that I think we're on now where we don't have that debate and all that citizens have are the kinds of self-help that, uh, that we would describe under the umbrella of going, of going dark? Can I just add, uh, David, you've done in a, a very small amount of time a Herculean effort of addressing the constitutional issues around the going dark debate. But I, but I want to point out that much of this debate is often framed in an information security, cyber security context, that um, if companies are forced uh, to build their systems and products in a way that always enables government access, that is very harmful to cybersecurity. Um, so I, I just want to make sure that, that it's not just a constitutional debate. In, in, in fact, you're one of the few people I've heard make such a strong constitutional case versus an information security or privacy. We, uh, we strive for novelty, if not responsibility, as academics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but you're absolutely right. And, and, the and the other dimension of the, so, uh, particularly with respect to encryption, is the First Amendment rights of, of companies. So Apple, um, it, Apple resisted uh, the, the court command in large part on First Amendment grounds, arguing they couldn't be forced to speak. Um, and they resisted the proposed legislation on the grounds that it would prohibit them from engaging in speech, namely the writing of encrypt of encryption code. Maybe I, I would just jump in at that point and 
try to uh, repeat my, I, uh, my, my observation that I don't think practically, um, and uh, that follows up to that uh, uh, um, point that it's hard to go dark in a connected uh, um, infrastructure, uh, because, as we just heard, like it will be about data being exchanged and uh, and um, about a lot of connections, and um, maybe in that situation it's almost impossible from the infrastructure to say somebody can go dark. Um, what I see is more that if we are going more and more into that kind of interconnected. Uh, uh, infrastructure and uh, everyday communication, then the principle needs to be dark and the right needs to be going light um, so that I can trust on the fact that connected cars and sensors trying to get track of everything in our life are by default going dark, that they don't know anything about me they know something about the air in this room or the not existing air in this room mm -hmm. or they know something about the number of people or uh, about ma many things about us, but they just don't know that, ex that it is exactly me what they know about and uh, that they can identify me, and but that, that it is up to the individual to decide I'm going uh, public with it or I'm doing the identification because I just would like to do something because only then uh, somebody still can decide to uh, uh, to um, uh, to go dark because that it, it is almost impossible to do that if we have these interconnected uh, devices uh, uh, working on the basis of uh, identifiable data all the time. People are even not understanding anymore, and that's the example which just. Uh, which you just showed, you, you lock on to the Wi-Fi, you don't even understand that you are sending a lot of personal data out in that uh, situation. You don't understand what's happening, and then, uh, of course, you lose the overview, and then uh, it is up to only very sophisticated lawyers to defend themselves in front of court on, uh, and to refer to the Fourth Amendment or to the right to data protection and privacy in Europe to uh, deny government access to that data. So I think that uh, the concepts which we have constitutionally are right. The point is just that in the digital connected uh, scene, it is almost impossible to uphold them without having re regulation on technology and how technology is being devolved, uh, developed so that uh, these principles are inherent part of that uh, infrastructure which we in which we are living. From a technology point of view, from a computer scientist point of view, that what Jan says is very desirable and actually, ideally, none of us would generate any data which is going to be shared. But as I hinted at in my presentation, this is probably not going to happen yeah, because the benefits of sharing the data will be so tempting. Everyone will, will obviously see this immediate gratification of doing it because you get something in return. Yeah, and sometimes it's free content, sometimes is that your life, will life quality will improve and the, the perceived risk of your privacy loss is just too small. Yeah, so from a psychological point of view, there's no way in, in winning this trade-off battle. Yeah, you will always be tempted to give, up, to give away your privacy, and that's why I think if we really as a society want to have privacy, we can't let the market use its own forces. Yeah, this is a classical thing of market failure. You would have to have regulation, which as Jan says, by default enforces that data is not going to be shared with, what, with whomever, with whatever. By default, you're basically dark. And that's also something which is very difficult to, to pull off yeah, because everyone in the society will always s see and believe that the benefits are there, they are quite tangible, so why not share it? Yeah? So why should we by default not share it? Why should we restrict ourselves to to not doing it, and that's that's what I find in this discussion so so interesting. Yeah, so how can we con actually convince the the average guy on the road that not sharing is actually better in the long run? More questions? Just walk up to the mic. I think you have to walk up to the mic uh, or within <coughs> the boat. And Niels from the German Bundestag uh, works there for the Greens. <coughs> so um, just I thought that was very interesting to 
to say the individual will immediately see the ben possible benefit for the for himself. But I also found it interesting that in the dogmatics of um, your book, uh, I think, or from your approach to constitutional law, you actually come up not with an individual solution, but you look at the the context of relationships and you construct it that way, and you see the the privileges like the, between a lawyer and his uh, uh, and his uh, citizen he works with, or the doctor, and uh, so you are immediately out of this individual benefit perspective, and you're looking closer into context in which data is flowing. And so I think the whole privacy discussion will be more specific, not just looking at individuals and this individual right, but more specific into the context and the possible construction of a protection there. And that will make it more understandable why we have to move in regu with regulation, maybe. Just there are two present. There were two panels that were relevant to that today. That uh, that I, I guess they're all broadcast. You get to see them later. But one um, was the first panel of the morning where it was suggested, and I think it's quite right that privacy is fundamentally a, pol uh, a collective good. Um, and so I've made the argument that the Fourth Amendment protects collective rights. And so and the other is um, that there is a developing uh, call for an ethics of data. Uh, collectors and 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 other entities that generate or have our data, um, that they should stop thinking of themselves solely as independent Machiavellian um, corporate interests, but rather as having a unique relationship with their consumers and users um, that has its own internal ethics. And so I think we'll see developing, hopefully, um, an ethics of, of technology companies that parallels the ethics of doctors and the ethical codes of clergymen and so forth. So we start to have a better understanding of what the what the duties of of protecting private communications between ourselves and our technology and our technology companies might look like. Um, I have a I have a question, uh, or I have the impression that um, the aspect of power differences is is somehow missing because if I say I can decide whether you know my body signals will be used or not, but what if I'm a former drug addict or if I'm I don't know. Um, a pregnant w a woman or whatever, and I'm in a, in um, I'm in an interview. Then I would I think I would have the right to not let the possible employer know that in advance, or I think I would have the right to reintegrate in society and not always have the sensors telling everyone you know that person still has whatever uh, um, in the blood or whatever changes. So when you say you went to the airport, uh, I think in this aspect you have be you are the more powerful person and uh, apart from the individual good someone could get from those signals i think we should also think of the people who could who cannot choose and who you know who are um, who are then kind of the, the data subjects that cannot choose to opt out and if we think if we think of them as well there's a certain um, kind of solidarity involved so maybe is that something um, i'd like to get a comment on this from the panel because it, in my feeling, it was very individualized, the responses. I would say until the last round, right? I think yeah. because that is why um, very often this example of connected traffic, connected mm -hmm. uh, mobility is used because then it will affect everyone. Mm, if yeah. you will drive a car in the future and um, the car industry makes the case that safety is a lot better with um, automatic driving, you driving a car by yourself, you will be at risk. And there will be a time when you will not be allowed, a human will not be allowed anymore to drive a car because it's much too risky. He could be tired, he could have had some beer before he went and on the drive ride. So I think eventually, you know, we will all be in the same boat. And that is why it's so important to discuss that now. Um, so I agree with you. And I would add, that the more data we have on individuals, the more accurate we can um, distinguish between individuals. Um, and <coughs> with the more accurate, I don't say that it will be completely accurate. I just say that we feel it to be more accurate. 
uh, which is the whole concept of big data and so on. So I think that it will aut come automatically th that with more sensors and with more persons to be tracked by that sensors, there will be more discrimination. Uh, just because it would be, at a certain moment, even unjust to not, not discriminate anymore. Because it's, it would be evident that two persons need to be treated differently because of the loads of information we have about them. And for society, it would not be uh, fine to treat, like, for example, smokers the same way le like non-smokers and so on. And we have the evidence on the table. So I think that that is also a very important part of uh, 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 an answer to that question. And it leads, uh, again, back to the point that um, uh, already the moment of having persons being tracked by sensors uh, is a step into that world. And uh, and we are just not only talking about law enforcement access, but also about power play, play between different actors in society as soon we talk about uh, uh, personal in information. If it's uh, depersonalized or anonymized information, then it would be far more difficult to do that. But still, there would be uh, uh, a potential to also reach the same usability. Uh, that is at least my belief, and I have the feeling that there is too less uh, investment of a society and of uh, uh, those who develop these services, and maybe also too heavy burden by regulators uh, to really endeavor that possibility to go another way, which is not uh, uh, exposing us to possible access of law enforcement to a certain information, process information, or to possible discrimination by uh, other actors. And uh, th so there are uh, two asymmetries, power asymmetries that are going on. One is just the pure asymmetry between an individual citizen and government. And the second is the informational asymmetries between a user and a technology company. Um, and I think both of those problems start to take on a different, uh, look different if we take seriously the collective interests on both sides of that. Um, and so if we think of, it, I hate to deploy solidarity of the people, um, but that's, if we, if we think about these things not as individual engagements with the state, but individuals as points of the spear of the people's engagements with the state, that looks different. Um, but to bring it back to the concrete question that sort of motivated this panel, imagine that you have a car, my car knows that I'm too drunk to drive, and it says, no, I'm not gonna turn on, go sober up and try again. The, 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 whole, the social benefit has been achieved. There's absolutely no reason for that information to be shared with the car company, much less law enforcement. Um, and so the real question here is, should that information, the, the public policy um, benefits of that sensor technology and the genesis and analysis of that information, should that then be something that's accessible to law enforcement? And I think there's a good case to be made that no, once you've achieved that social benefit, it's something that in order that the right balance of powers um, should leave that information in a black box on your car, which I think would be dangerous, <laughs> or just or just erase or just erase it. Yeah. Um, may I ask a question again? Uh, <laughs> okay. The bell, the, bell, uh, the bell is not told. Uh, I, uh, you just say the car identifies you are drunk or tired or something like that, and uh, my uh, colleague already has a car which has such a sensor in it, and he just has the wrong face or the wrong uh, mood or something. I don't know. Every time, he, uh, independently, what time of day it is, how much he slept or so, he sits in the car, he turns the car on, and the car tells him, drive, uh, uh, st uh, brake, uh, <laughs> let the car stay, you are tired, you cannot drive. This is uh, the question. And if he drives without this, what uh, will the people think that see the data that says he drove uh, while tired? It's so not so much the question what the people will think, but I mean, there was actually a case in Switzerland that someone was told by his car he should not drive anymore, but he thought that he's perfectly okay to drive, and he hit someone. And later in court, that was disclosed and was used as evidence against him because the car told him he should not drive, and he decided to drive anyway. But then, as we learn from you, and as you pointed out before, that's not very reliable data at the moment, but he had no way to make a case to challenge this data. And so there's the whole 
sorry about how we, in the future, if such data will enter criminal cases, how will we be able, how will defense be able to salvage such data? But, data. but I think even if they don't kick us out, it's people fine. have a right. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.